Uh, thank you so much, Dan, and welcome, Marcus. It's so great to have you here. Thanks for uh, having me. For, for those of you who don't know us, uh, Marcus and I are actually longtime friends. Uh, Marcus is originally from London, and I had the pleasure of working out of the London office for a couple of years when we were both at CareerBuilder. So we've stayed in touch, and when Marcus founded EQ, EQ Community, um, we decided this is a really phenomenal time for us to do a study together um, because we have this phenomenal passion. Marcus has this incredible community that's really insightful and really passionate about this work. Um, and of course, the Question Pro, we have survey technology, we have access to a lot of different people that we can have this conversation with and ask around what's going on in the market. Um, and so here we are. So we'll kick off our conversation um, a little more broadly, and then actually, you are going to be the first group that's going to hear some of our insights from the brand new diversity and inclusion study that we concluded. So it hasn't been published yet, it's in the works, but you'll be the first ones to get a, a preview of what's going on in the market. So without further ado, Marcus, again, we've been friends for a really long time. I've been a big fan of yours personally, professionally, you've done some really incredible things that I really admire. Um, when you founded the EQ community, like what was you went from a deck or you went from hundreds <laughs> of flights a year um, and doing really incredible things too, like what was the tipping point where you decided this is what I want to do and now is the time for it? Yeah, so um, kind of thinking about it again, at that particular moment, we were in the midst of a pandemic and there were a lot of opportunities to have times to think. So I took up something that I didn't think I'd take up. So I played a little bit of sports, but I was started running every day just to get out of my house. <laughs> and when you do that, you start to think slightly differently. So I was reflecting on where I am. I was in the US at the time, so I moved to the Bay Area. And it was like, well, if I can't help people get access to opportunities that I think are meaningful I'm not entirely sure like who will be able to do that so that was like one thing and then I, then I always do these three circles and you probably know them which is like where's your passion and I wanted to help people get access to more opportunities where's the market going there was obviously a big inflection point with um, a lot of the social movements that happened in the US and then where's your skill set and it was around recruiting so thought through it a lot six months of running and um, said I'm going to jump and I didn't jump off a bridge even though I'd run to a bridge every day and I was kind of looking at I was like well this is going to be a big jump took the leap of faith and decided to uh, set up a company and the whole focus first was really bringing people together so it's a members based platform and then helping companies get access to opportunities but there was uh, one other thing that happened that I think is important to note and I would advise if anybody's ever gonna set up a company is to figure out like what problem you wanna solve first. And I had the opportunity to work with some private equity firms and they all said they wanted to do something around DNI when I was consulting with them, but they didn't know how. Mm -hmm. So my thing was like, if you become my first customer, <laughs> then that'll be a good start. So that's a little bit of the origin story. Oh, I love it. And I'm so glad that you, you took that leap because seeing some of the things that are coming out of it and just seeing the tremendous opportunity still um, for us to create more inclusive workplaces where people really feel like they belong. And we still, we have quite a ways to go. So when you think about what there, if there is a need, <laughs> there certainly is. So um, just one more question before we jump into some of the data. What are you most excited or hopeful about in this space today? Well, long term, what I'm most hopeful about is that our purpose can change and evolve, should I say. So our purpose today is to empower people of colour to thrive. And I hope it just gets to a point where it's just empower people to thrive. But I think at this point, there's some inequities that need to really transform in order to give people access to some of the opportunities that others may have had. Yeah. So that's what I'm hopeful of. Um, what I'm most excited about is always the momentum and the excitement that people have when they talk about it. Yeah. And then the question is, is like, what action can we do to 
to change and drive things. But I, I almost think, and this is why it's labelled diversity, a superpower, big sports background. And so for me, it's all about teams. Yeah. And your team, you don't want everyone playing in the same position. You don't want everyone bringing the same skills to that particular team. So it's really about understanding and seeing organisations as teams. Mm -hmm. And now we're a bit more distributed. Maybe that will be how, how it's viewed. And then the best team wins, which is fine. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Uh, so now jumping into the study that I mentioned, we, it's literally hot off the presses. We collected data between October 15th and 21st. So today is the 27th. So imagine um, the teams and the hours that Marcus and I sat there in Question Pro running analysis and correlations and cross tabs and understanding what's going on in the market. Um, it was done through, it was a, a sample of 1,000 knowledge workers across the United States. So it was not an aggregation of employee experience surveys inside a company. It was actually a sample across um, the country. And the reason I say that, that I think is important, is a lot of times, you know, we'll get questions around some sensitive issues. How was that framed in the organization? Was there anonymity? Was there confidentiality? Were people tr were transparent? Um, this was a completely anonymous survey, completely voluntary, and across a span of different organizations. So, um, and one thing to note, of course, for any of you that are doing research or employee experience inside your organizations, your data might be different. Um, what we hope with some of these findings is that it helps you think about what are maybe some of the most important questions to ask today. Um, and how might your organization be similar or different to what we're seeing in the market. So um, th we found some really interesting things and that's great because again, there's a lot of research in this area. There's a lot of current research in this area and oftentimes we think, well, we know a lot of the challenges, but what are the solutions? So um, we have some really great things that we'll share and we have some of maybe like tougher things, but that I hope will actually get you thinking um, even more and spring you in, into action even more. So one of the things that we found is, again, there's a lot of work done in organizations around DNI, probably more today than ever before. But when we asked um, the people in our study how satisfied they were with how much action is taken in fostering a diverse culture, 42% were not satisfied with what their organization was doing. So if you think about again, today there's probably more action than ever. People are still saying, I want more. I'm looking for more. Maybe I'm grateful for what we're doing so far, but I don't see that as enough. Um, and then when we highlight, and again, the report will come out, so I will not go through all of the nuances of data, but we, we pull out some highlights. Um, Can I just add something, please? Yes. <laughs> on, that, on that 42%. I think what's important to know is that all these folks are from different backgrounds. So this wasn't just people who are considered African American or mm -hmm. considered maybe Latinx or Asian. It was across. So it was mm -hmm. everybody had that view. And I know you're going to go into the next one, but I think that's just important yeah. to, to kind of tie no, into that. No, thank you. Thank you for highlighting that. And, and to Marcus's point, so 42% was across the board, um, but the largest group that showed dissatisfaction was black and African-American workers at 50%. Um, so overall, people were looking for more, but then when we teased out some of the differences, um, that was one of the groups that really stood out and, and said, I want even more than this. Um, so Marcus, what are you seeing in your work? Like, what do you see organizations doing today? And what do you think they can maybe be doing differently? Because again, there's a lot of energy behind it. So is it a matter of doing more? Is it a matter of doing something differently? Like what, when you saw that data point, and I know that was the one, and Marcus went through all the data too, I'm the PhD, uh, but he went through all of the different findings and highlighted th a lot of things himself. And this was one of the ones that jumped out at both of us. Um, what do you make of this? <laughs> yeah, so I think that um, one of the things that was interesting for me, at least, was if you look at the population of the US, just and it was, it was a, a somewhat of a representation of that, not precisely, but was close enough, was that the disparity wasn't just with um, folks that were in one particular 
race or one particular area, it was across the board. And again, I think about it to teams. If one player in a team is unhappy or two people are unhappy in a team, and we've always seen it, you have to kind of change the makeup of that team. And I think that's having a, a bigger impact into happiness at work generally. The other thing, and I know that you'll get into this, but I think it's important to tie the two into it. The other thing that we found out is that not only were people unhappy, but what percentage would actually leave their job and mm -hmm. switch. And again, it, it, and that's if the DEI programs are not acted upon. And I think that people just want a voice. And I was, I, I don't think I was, I don't know if I was surprised or not. I didn't really know what to expect. Yeah. So I went in with, a, with an open mind and this is why we'd done the study because I didn't know the answers to the questions. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, I think it's something that impacts us all and not just an, it, as an individual. And I think that's something that I really took away from the study overall. Yeah, I love your analogy to teams because it is right. A lot of times, always, we're as successful as those people around us. And if not, we have to carry the extra weight and that's exhausting and it's not necessarily the place you want to be in. And sometimes when we look at this kind of research or these kinds of initiatives, we think, well, maybe it pertains to a particular group, but really it doesn't. It impacts all of us. Um, and so the teaser that Marcus just gave around people leaving organizations, um, a lot of what we're hearing about lately is work flexibility, pay benefits, different things like that. Well, when we asked how likely somebody would switch employers, we actually found that 37% would switch employers to become a part of a more inclusive culture. 37%. So when you think about the reflection, when you think about asking people, how satisfied are you being here? Are you satisfied with your pay, your benefits? How's your manager doing? How often are we asking this and how often are we asking about the likelihood of leaving? Um, so it's got a, a, a two-pronged challenge, right? One is the retention and one is the attraction. So when we're talking with people and we're promoting our organization, these individuals that are saying I would be likely to leave, they'll be likely to leave for the organization that is saying this is one of the most important things to me. And you're gonna be seen and you're going to be heard and you're going to be a critical part of this organization. Now, one of the things I wanted to ask you um, is do you see organizations tracking this kind of metric? No, I don't think they do. And and that was one of the main reasons I wanted us to do this together because it's quite hard when you're inside of the organization to answer these questions in a particular way where you don't want to come across like you want to leave the company. Yeah. So I think the independence of that was, was really important. Um, and again, and I'll use the team's analogy again and, and maybe another one, schools. If you had 34% of the kids that said that they would be likely to leave the school, that they were... In, that will probably have a detrimental impact on the school that your kids are. I've got two kids, and I think that would have a significant impact on how people feel about it. So I think that it's just really important to know that we all win together, yeah. and it's not a zero-sum game, and especially when you're on the same team in the same company. So if people around you are not able to perform to the best, your company's not going to be able to perform to the best, and guess what? Maybe you don't get that promotion, or maybe you're not in that position where you can grow your compensation because your team's not thriving. Yeah. And so I think that this is really important to figure out like how do we make teams thrive and also even more because teams are not together always physically. Yeah. And you were talking a lot about that earlier about being remote. How do you create that gel where mm -hmm. people feel like they're part of something special? And I, and I also think the other thing that you mentioned was around the purpose and bringing yeah. that purpose together. So yeah. those are some of the things that I'm thinking about as, as we're going through the study now. I'm yeah. just... Absolutely, and I think the, what you brought up is a, is a really good point around um, the sum of all the parts. And Alan, thinking about the book that you recommended to me that I'm reading right now, The Sum of Us by Heather McGee, um, and she said one of the big challenges in these kinds of initiatives is that we have a, when we have this challenge, it's a win-lose mentality, that if Marcus wins something, I'll lose. But that's very rarely the case, because if we can figure out that win-win, we'll both be infinitely better off together. Um, so it's changing the mentality. And I do, I love, and I think in our, in our work, when we put the report together and push it out, I think the teams is a really good analogy of how you win together, um, especially in sports, because you just have to have that good gel. And if you have big challenges, it'll, it'll drag everybody down. And I just, and how many, how many times has anybody received an email from their manager or a leader and they've been addressing everybody and they've put team at the top. 
Has anybody ever received that email? We said, hey, team. Mm -hmm. like, you are a team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't know why we think about it like outside of, mm -hmm. uh, well, it just pertains to sports, but inside of that mm -hmm. organization, it's about making sure that mm -hmm. the team dynamics are correct in order for that company yeah. to thrive. So Absolutely. Um, and then the last one, before we go into some more optimistic insights, because we do want to um, share some of those, is... Um, talking about psychological safety, talking about sharing your voice and being heard. So there's a lot of thought around now, how do we give our employees a voice? How do we make sure people have that courage to raise their hand? What kind of avenues do we give them? Um, if we have an all hands meeting, how good does somebody feel you know, raising their hand in front of everyone and sharing something? especially if it's constructive criticism, especially if it's something challenging, um, what are the different avenues? And how do we encourage that? Well, one of the things, and another one that really you know, took us aback is for the individuals that find the right avenue, for the individuals that share their opinion, 35% of people said they don't feel like their opinions are taken into account when they do share them. Now, this doesn't mean that every opinion needs to be acted on. Sometimes there are going to be brilliant ideas. Um, sometimes there may be going to be ideas that can't be action now, maybe not ever. But the only way that we're going to really advance as a society is to really understand how the different people are feeling, how they're thinking, and what their recommendations are. So how many times are you going to raise your hand, whether it's in person, virtually, provide an anonymous recommendation? I feel like absolutely nothing happened with it. Um, when you reach the point to say, well, it's useless, I'm not going to do this anymore. Um, and of course, there were some differences between groups. So when we think about inclusion and we think about belonging, um, and oftentimes the different groups that we want to bring in even more, what we found is that this was particularly pronounced, for example, with 40% of black and 41% of Hispanic workers feeling that their voice is not taken into account. Um, and then 40% of women compared to 28% of men. So a lot of times when you have these groups that you want to hear from because you're saying, well, maybe at the leadership level, we're still not as diverse, but we want to be inclusive. How are you doing? These groups are the ones prevalently saying, well, I don't know, because you keep asking me, you're not doing anything about it, you're not even hearing me, why would I keep telling you? Um, Marcus, <laughs> what do we do with this? Like, what could organizations be doing that they're not doing right now? Like, in, in your experience, is it about how we get the information, is it about how we communicate back? Like, where, where do we go from here? Yeah, look, I, I think we're actually at a time where there's a huge opportunity because the way that organizations are structured is slightly different now. So there isn't always an epicenter where the headquarters has all the power and so you have this opportunity to actually crowdsource inside of your organization ideas. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the companies that are successful, just generally speaking, believe that the knowledge isn't in one place. And so you almost want more of those ideas. Not only you don't have to action them all. When I was leading digital transformation, we looked at 1,600 HR tech companies before we invested in 10. Now, I didn't look at them all. I had teams all around the world that were looking at them all, and then we had people that were in the company with 30,000 employees, we leveraged that. What I learned from that is that people felt like they were on the journey. Mm -hmm. So I think what employers can do and what you can do inside your organization, just make sure people feel like they can contribute mm -hmm. and their voice is being heard because you'll probably find some things you didn't know. And again, that's the power of diversity of thought. Yeah. getting ideas from different places. The, like, one of my best advisors right now is my seven-year-old son. Uh, he just looks <laughs> at things completely differently. Um, and in two ways, right? I might tell him to tidy up his room or try and find a remote control and he's been looking around forever and he can't find it and I come in and find it. That's one thing, so we look at things differently. <laughs> but on the other side, he will give me a perspective on what he thinks and how he sees the world. And I think we can do that inside of the organisation. It's hard to collect it all and then take everybody else's opinion and you have to make a decision, so it's tough. Yeah. But given that feeling like you're listening to someone, yeah. 
important. Yeah. Yeah, and I think in one of our previous conversations, I think something else that we mentioned is um, when somebody's comfortable sharing their opinion publicly, um, making that visible and saying that so and so share this and it was incredibly valuable, giving them giving them visibility and giving them recognition. Because even, for example, if I as a woman maybe at some point don't feel comfortable saying something because what if I have negative repercussions? What if it's not actioned? But then I see a voice of a different woman inside my organization, and she shared something, and she was lifted up and praised toward it. I thought, ah, okay, she represents me too, and not only am I glad that somebody that I feel like I can really associate with or might have similar challenges, similar hopes and dreams to me, um, is, seeing, is being seen and heard and she represents me, it gives me the courage and the confidence the next time I raise my hand, my voice will be taken into account too. Um, so when there is that comfort of individual visibility, when it's not something that's anonymous for that to be celebrated, I think can also have a really positive effect as well. Now I said we're gonna have some good news. <laughs> so it's not, a lot of times with this data, we know we have a big opportunity, right? I think every one of you, um, if I stopped you in the hall and said, do you think we've arrived? Do you think that diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, like we're there as a society? I don't think anybody would say yes, right? So I think it's good to continue to highlight these areas because we're constantly thinking about what do we continue to push forward? Where is the greatest opportunity? Because we all have limited amount of time where is that greatest investment? Now, some of the really, really phenomenal things, and I think you know, we mentioned Black Lives Matter, matter that happened, Asian hatred on the rise, um, anti-Semitism that's happening and in, in a lot in the media now. And so you would think, but how are people getting along? Like from day to day, what kind of experience are employees having with each other? Um, and again, this is the one where Marcus and I stopped and said, this is worth celebrating this is worth highlighting. 83% um, said that they find it easy to work with colleagues that have different perspectives. And this was completely equal across races and genders. So they find it easy to work with. It's not like, oh, no, but people, like, it, it's challenging. I can't do it. Like, they have these crazy ideas. We don't see eye to eye. 83% is a really, really high number. The second one, 87% said that during their career, they have learned a great deal from colleagues who have had different backgrounds than them. 87%. So people enjoy working with others, people learn a great deal. And then we combine them and even got an even higher percentage of 90% of workers saying that they actually enjoy learning from colleagues of different, pers of different perspectives, and this was consistent across races and genders. So when we think about, um, Al again mentioned Adam Grant's book, Think Again, and I love, I love Adam Grant's work, I love that book. Um, he highlights the importance of considering other people's perspectives, opening our eyes, not blocking out things that maybe individuals are seeing differently than us and what the value is. And for workers, not only of different races and genders, but different levels of experience, different age groups. People are seeing a lot of value in learning and how much they themselves are advancing as humans because of that. So when we think about creating these systems, when we think about creating these communities, um, it is something that people very much welcome um, and look forward to because when they reflect on the past, it's, it's been positive. So just to add a few yes. points, because those, those are big numbers, right? So 90% of, of people feel like they can learn from, from others. Now, I think a lot of the time, we have these experiences of what things are gonna be like in our head before they happen. Mm. But once you've had that experience of working with someone from maybe a, a different perspective to you, and you build that bond and you have a conversation, you actually realize, you know what, we're a lot more similar than we thought we were um, previously. And just to talk a little bit about what we do at EQ in the community, we provide a community based on interests and passions. And we've used sports, but you've got film, you've got TV, you've got crypto, you've got different areas where people connect. 
And finding that, I think, inside of organizations is super important because a lot of the time it, you've, people have been segregated inside of organizations. And you've got these ERGs that make up very different groups and separate groups. People are like, well, why am I not part of that group? Or why am I not part of this group? If you have an interest in something, whether it's, I don't know, it's wine or it's whiskey, whatever, people start to gather around that. And I think that's really important to think about the experiences that you've had as individuals, just meeting people from different backgrounds. And it all seems like, I mean, I'm, not, I'm sure all of you don't live in Austin, so you probably travel across the US and probably traveled also internationally. And some of your best experiences have probably been in restaurants that you may not make that same food at home. And that comes from a different culture. And kind of realigning that into the workplace, like how do I get these rich experiences and then bringing that back into your company is, is key, just really putting people around passions yeah. and interests. And yesterday I heard even some really goofy groups, like my plants didn't make it, like a support group for people that killed their plants on accident. Um, they're weird, different things, different interests, like Marcus was saying, but that, um, not only brings people's similar passions together, but it also really helps us understand like what are what are our commonalities, but then what are the differences? Like to me, I, I love being you know around people who have similar opinions than me, and we'll chat about the world. Um, but how interesting is it when somebody brings something different? Like when you learn something different, when you're saying I had no idea that that existed, and that's why I'm so passionate about travel because it's one way to do it. Um, but just having a conversation with somebody that opens up to your eyes what the possibilities are, I think is incredibly powerful. And I, and I think there's a big nuance in that around perspectives and people being the same as each other. I think what we generally strive for as human beings is that we've got some similar principles. Mm -hmm. And whether that is like, look, we want to look after our family, we want to make sure our kids go to decent schools, we want to ensure that we live in a safe environment and aligning on those, and then you find just different ways to connect outside of that. And it was just, yeah, I think 90% is just a huge number yeah. once you spend that time to connect with people. No, yeah, absolutely. Um, so moving on to another topic when we think about, okay, so there's these great opportunities. People in general really enjoy being around each other. They see value in it. So what are some considerations? Um, we've done a lot of culture research, and a lot of times when you ask across an organization how you experience a culture, do you enjoy working here, how do you see it, we find pretty significant differences between management and individual contributors. And a lot of times it's what they're exposed to, the flow of information. Now, um, culture to control it just from the top or to control it just from an HR department is incredibly difficult and oftentimes nearly impossible. So a lot of times it comes down to teams. It comes down to the managers. How are they interacting with their teams? What are they saying is important in the organization? And what's so, so important is to highlight um, to make sure the managers don't necessarily believe that the way they see the organization is the exact same way that their team experiences the organization. Um, so what does that mean? For one example is we asked um, our study participants how satisfied they are with how inclusive their culture is, right? And what we found is that there was a difference between managers and individual contributors where 67% of managers were overall satisfied, um, but only 61% of individual contributors. Um, now, that a lot of times, well, I'll pause there before I jump into my, uh, my next um, data point. Marcus, what have you seen when it comes to exposure to information, when it comes to how people experience the culture differently in that, that specific dynamic? Like, what could be, um, for those individuals in the room that maybe, you know, do manage teams and are thinking about how do I make sure that we do have this inclusive culture? What would be, and how are, how are my people feeling about it? What would be some of your recommendations? <clears throat> yeah, so I, I went to, um, I think it was in 2017, I went to, um, I went to a, a country in Asia and I was with the group CIO at the time and he traveled all around the world and he had big teams, he was a big pharmaceutical company before, like 30,000 employees our current one in like 78,000. And one thing that he always done every time he got a group together was he 
you take people out to a bar, that's one thing you do. And some people drink, some people don't, right? But he decided, in this scenario, we didn't know each other, you're all going to go in and do karaoke. And, okay, so everyone's a bit taken back by it, it's not everyone's thing. But everybody got them put into a situation where they had to bond, like, really quickly. And I think by, again, like, giving people experiences that are memorable yeah. together really starts to change. So I, I feel like managers have the ability to do that. Yeah. And a lot of the time, your job is not to tell people what to do. It's to create the environment so they can thrive. Yeah. So how do you do that to bring the best out of your people? Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of leaders in this room as well. And it's, it, it's again, it's just not about you. It's about the team. It's yeah. those that are delivering the work that you want to get done and that purpose. So maybe thinking about bringing people together yeah. in weird environments. Not always karaoke, <laughs> you can do something else. Experiment with different things. Um, so one other thing that came up was the importance of communication. And like we were saying, sometimes as a management team or somebody in a manager role, you may be privy to more information around what your organization is doing than necessarily trickles down to your teams. And that came out when we asked um, how satisfied our different participants were with how frequently their company discusses the importance of diversity, 19% only said they were extremely satisfied. Like my company's acing it. Um, and I'm looking at my friend Andy, whose organization does a lot of organizational communication. We actually recently recorded a mm. podcast around those challenges. How do you get everyone in the organization that critical information and the challenge around we already see a big part of um, people are not that satisfied with the diversity and inclusion initiatives inside their organization but then if you're doing something how do you make sure that people actually know about it um, so that on the opposite so looking at managers and individual contributors when we looked at even just overall satisfied so they don't have to be extremely they can be somewhat satisfied Managers were, 60% of managers were satisfied and only 48% of individual contributors. So you see that really big gap around, well, I think the organization is doing something, but I'm not really sure what, like do I know about it? Is it impacting me? Is it going to eventually impact me? Um, so what, Marcus, what do you think are some of the ways that that awareness can be increased. So especially if an organization is doing something, how do we make sure that our employees will want to know about it and that what the organization is doing is really resonating and having a positive impact on them? Yeah, so it, it comes down to priorities um, inside the company and, it, and then it comes down to the value of DNI for your organization. And this is why I talk about DNI being a superpower. If you really see that it's a superpower, you're going to have that on all of the material where you're having conversations. Now, that's not going to happen immediately and initially. Mm -hmm. But I, th I think thinking about where it could be included in company-wide discussions is really important. But the other part is leverage your teams to share that information for you as well. Yeah. So if you've got more than 10 or 20 people and they've got more than 10 or 20 people that follow them online, you can start to show and share what you're doing. Um, I think, but I think it's less about talking about it, to be really honest. I think you've just got to do some stuff. Yeah. Uh, I feel like, yeah, okay, it hasn't been communicated, but if you hire a diverse leadership team and a company's performing well, you don't have to talk about it because it's, yeah. it's, it's there. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I actually think less talking, more yeah. action is, yeah. is the way forward. But yet, of course, you've got to communicate that internally if you've got n no, no one aware of what's going on. And I think that, yeah, you can leverage the team that's inside of the company mm. in order to deliver that for you. Yeah, and that communication not necessarily being one way either, not saying, well, this is what we're doing. This is what, you know, this is what we're doing that expect, we expect to be helping you, um, but continue to have that dialogue. Because earlier we talked about experimenting with things and trying things and some things working really well and other things not. Um, something's working really well initially and then you get your best return on investment right away and then it tapers off. Um, for people to be involved and passionate but also to continue to have that dialogue. Like I was mentioning in, in my work, I try a lot of different initiatives because I'll say I'll, I don't know things that have resonated with people two years ago, five years ago, 
they might not anymore at all. Or they might resonate in other organizations, but they might not resonate with my team. And so I think a lot of times, if it's that dialogue, whether it's one-to-one, -one, whether it's within a group, whether it's by using technology, where you're constantly getting input from others, it's not necessarily communication only in the traditional sense of sending updates, but it's keeping that dialogue going. Um, and it also helps with understanding how are we doing with this? It helps with that satisfaction around are we actually doing the diversity initiatives um, and inclusion initiatives that can help our organization? If we set them a year ago, are they still effective today? You look like you want to say something. No. <laughs> Jump on in. All good. No. Um, so those were just some, some general highlights um, that we wanted to share. Like we keep mentioning, we just completed this study. There's a lot of really interesting findings. We're going to be releasing it in phases because that's one of the things too. Like we keep saying the world changes so quickly. Um, and what people are looking for changes more quickly now than ever before. And so we want to make sure to get all of those findings in your hands as fast as possible so you can action them. And to do a big robust report all at once um, takes a little bit. So we will be doing it in chapters, in thematical chapters. Um, I think hopefully you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you can find Marcus on LinkedIn. Um, you can also contact me. My email is sanyalacina at questionpro.com. One of the things that Marcus and I are going to be doing is, again, this is just the tip of the iceberg of the data that we have. And again, like he kept me really honest trying to cut things down too because we had so many numbers we wanted to share. For this time period, it's too much. Um, but being staying honest to our intention and our approach, we'd love to have a dialogue with any of you who are interested because we look at this data and based on our passion, our experience, and our interest, we're seeing it a certain way and interpreting it a certain way. But there is a beautiful diversity of experiences and thoughts in this room. Um, so if you're interested in being one of the first to see more information, if you're interested in saying, you know, I have something that I'd love to share, I'd have some insights that I'd love to contribute to this study, please contact either one of us. We would love to have that conversation because again, this is by no means the end of a DNI journey. It's just a part of it. So the more um, we can get the community involved and truly do this together, I think the much greater impact we'll be able to have. Marcus, any last words before we turn it over to the next session? <laughs> Look, I think um, firstly, thank you for all taking the time to listen because it's important that we have this conversation with everybody around the e and I. It's not like a one person, it's a team effort. And so if you take anything away from it, just think that your organizations are teams and they have a purpose and we all wanna serve that purpose to do better. And if you are hiring any diverse talent or you just want great talent, contact me because I can help you. Thank you so much, everybody. It's just been a pleasure spending this time with you. and. Enjoy the rest of the conference, and if you want to have a quick chat with either one of us at some point, we'll, we'll be around, and we will be sticking around for happy hour as well. So thank you all again so much. <laughs>